All right, there we go. All right, so good morning, everybody. Um, happy happy Friday, and welcome to um, this week's AMSSM Sports Ultrasound Case Series. Um, so this this uh, this talk today kind of starts the beginning of our fellow presentation. So you know, previously we had we had staff docs giving all of the talk, and now we're going to transition for the next uh, couple months to similar presentations, but, but given by um, some, some rather outstanding fellows that we have asked to, uh, to give presentations here. Um, today's talk is by Dr. Allison Schrader. She is the current sports medicine fellow at Mayo Clinic Square up in Minneapolis. Uh, she did her residency in PM&R at UPMC out in Pittsburgh, and she is going back to UPMC after fellowship um, to join uh, join the folks out there, and will also be taking over as associate sports medicine uh, fellowship program director. So I've worked with Allison quite a bit recently over uh, the past past few years. We've taught some ultrasound courses together, and have a couple of papers that came out recently. And she she does an incredible job. She's a highly skilled ultrasonographer and is doing some some really cool and really uh, really great work. So I will, for the sake of time, I'll turn it over to Allison, and uh, you can get rolling. Awesome, thank you. Let me share here. Can you see that okay? Yep, you're good to go. Perfect. Um, so I'll be talking about the uh, ultrasound scan of the proximal hamstring region today. I don't have any disclosures. And before I get started, I do have to thank um, my mentors here at Mayo, especially Dr. Gelsing, my program director, Dr. Sellen, Dr. Payne, my mentors in the past at UPMC. Um, and then a special thanks to Dr. Hoffman, um, Cruz and Hall for putting on this ultrasound case series. It's been an excellent supplement to my ultrasound education. I have watched every single video. Um, so the main learning objectives today will attempt to understand the protocol for sonographic sonographic evaluation of the proximal hamstring region and apply this to a specific case. So I'm not gonna be giving a comprehensive presentation of every single pathology in this region, but rather look specifically at one case and kind of talk about how we would evaluate this step-by-step step and then write a comprehensive ultrasound report, which I think is probably one of the more challenging pieces is how do we put what we see into words. So this is a case of a 48 year old female. She was an avid runner coming in with four years of atraumatic right worse than left um, inferior buttock region pain. She described the pain as an achy soreness, seven out of 10 at worst, two out of 10 at best. Um, it would occasionally radiate into the mid thigh posteriorly but nothing more distally and no numbness or tingling. Um, it was worse when she was trying to run and any activities that would stretch or activate the hamstring as well as if she was sitting on hard surfaces. She had done extensive physical therapy, including eccentric exercises um, with not much relief. And she had had a prior PRP injection to the left side um, with minimal improvement. On exam, she had tenderness to palpation over the ischial tuberosities bilaterally, pain with resisted hamstring strength testing when she was prone, but her strength was five out of five. And she also had pain with uh, bridging, no uh, negative intraarticular hip, SI joint, um, and lumbar spine exam. And because her pain was worse on the right side, that was kind of where we focused our evaluation. So she had x-rays previously to coming to see us of both the pelvis and the lumbar spine. You can see some moderate degenerative change, maybe a little bit of calcification in the labrum on her left side, as well as some uh, facet hypertrophy and arthritis and SI joint arthritis. Um, nothing major at the ischial tuberosity regions that we could appreciate on the radiographs. So we proceeded with a diagnostic ultrasound at this point. And when we think about the uh, proximal hamstring region, there are a lot of structures in this area. Dr. Borgstein a few weeks ago gave a very thorough review of some of the other structures to examine in the posterior hip scan. I'm gonna focus more today on the hamstring region looking at the ischial tuberosity and bursa, conjoint tendon, um, which becomes biceps femoris muscle and semitendinosus muscle, semimembranosus tendon to the muscle, 
um, sciatic nerve, quadratus femoris, posterior hip joint, obturator internus, and sacro tuberous, tuberous ligament. And these structures, I think, um, give you a pretty comprehensive uh, overview of the proximal hamstring region. Other structures that you can uh, think about scanning if you do this basic protocol and are still not finding something that really fits with your clinical picture, um, you can consider looking at the uh, deep hip external rotators um, other than the obturator internus, including superior gemellus and inferior gemellus, adductor magnus, um, especially the hamstring portion that attaches to the medial side of the ischial tuberosity, gluteus maximus and medius muscle and tendon, piriformis, posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, um, the pudendal neurovasculature and the sacrospinous ligament. And as I mentioned, Dr. Borgstein covered some of these previously, and today we'll focus mostly on um, the structures inside the box here. So anytime before we're performing an ultrasound scan, I'm trying to think before we begin um, what I am going to expect and what I need to think about in terms of setting up, setting myself up for success. Um, so first of all, is ultrasound the best imaging modality in this situation? Um, the posterior hip, depending on body habitus, can be very difficult to um, image with an ultrasound if someone has a lot of adipose tissue, or if you have an elderly patient with a lot of muscle atrophy that um, causes like the glute max to be more hyperechoic and difficult to visualize deep to that, uh, ultrasound might not be your best imaging modality. The transducer selection um, in this location too, I think is important. And I often find that we're going back and forth between the curvilinear and a linear transducer just to see which um, gives us the most optimal image and with the curve linear, if you have a very low frequency transducer, usually less than five, it's somewhat difficult to see and distinguish um, some of the smaller structures. So if you have a higher frequency, but still curve linear transducer, that's typically better. Um, and then when we're looking at the patient, they'll be prone and you can put a pillow under their hips that uh, extends the hamstring, tendons and muscles slightly uh, and allows you for that better visualization. And the other thing that's important, especially in this region, is to understand the anatomy that you're looking at before you go into the scan. There are a lot of structures in this region that overlap, and things can get um, confusing if you're not in, you're, if you're not really good with your anatomy. So we're going to go through that just very briefly. Um, these are some pictures from Essential Anatomy, but I think it at least gives us a quick overview of the structures that we're going to look at. So ischial tuberosity, as you all know, the quadratus femoris um, extends between that and this intertrochanteric notch here. The obturator internus comes out of the lesser sciatic foramen, just proximal kind of to this ischial tuberosity and adductor magnus, as I mentioned, attaches on the medial side um, of the ischial tuberosity. It's kind of deep in this image. The semimembranosus attaches to the lateral side of the ischial tuberosity and then has this quick course medially before it extends down the thigh. And the conjoint tendon is made up of the semitendinosus, more medial, and the biceps femoris, more lateral, which attach onto the ischial tuberosity. And then the ischial bursa sits kind of on top is that potential space over top of the hamstring tendons and the ischial tuberosity there. And then the sciatic nerve is running laterally to the ischial tuberosity, just superficial to the quadratus femoris. And you can see that sciatic nerve relation, it will run deep to the biceps femoris as we go down the thigh. So I think it's important to have this in mind as we go through the images and correlate that with what we expect to see on ultrasound. Um, so typically when I'm scanning a region, I try to think about starting at a place where we have a home base. Um, and in the hamstring scan, I think there are two main places that can help find a spot so you can orient yourself to what you're seeing and then follow the structures from there. And so the first one that I think about is the ischial tuberosity. So we have the transducer um, and anatomic transverse plane here. And you expect to see the ischial tuberosity with the quadratus femoris laterally, the sciatic nerve sitting on top of the quadratus femoris, the semimembranosus tendon on the more lateral side, and um, the conjoint tendon sitting most uh, superficial. As you would scan distally around this gluteal fold, you will typically see what we call the triangle of Cohen or the hyperechoic triangle. 
and that hyperechoic structures are made up of the semimembranosus tendon more medially, the conjoint tendon um, in the middle and the sciatic nerve on the lateral side. And those separate the semitendinosus muscle, the biceps femoris muscle and the adductor magnus muscle. And so I, I just went through a lot of the anatomic structures quickly, but these are images that you kind of need to have in your brain before you go into the scan to make sure you understand and can orient yourself um, to what you're seeing on the ultrasound images. So we'll start through kind of our typical protocol. And like I mentioned, we usually start at a place that we know. It, one is the ischial tuberosity. And typically starting with the curvilinear transducer gives us this wide field of view to see um, kind of broadly. So ischial tuberosity is the hyperechoic bone. We have the quadratus femoris to the side and the sciatic nerve sitting on top of it and lateral is on the right side of this image and medial is on the left. And that orientation will be the same kind of as I go throughout this talk. And in the upper right corner here, you'll see somewhat the orientation of the transducer so that can help orient you as I'm going through the presentation. The ischial versa is a potential space kind of sitting on top of the hamstring tendons here, um, pointed to by the arrow. Um, and then this, is just a video where we have Doppler flow on, trying to look to see if we see any flow within the bursa. Um, you can also look for fluid in the bursa. That's extremely uncommon. Oftentimes, even with the Doppler, we don't see much Doppler flow, even in cases of ischial bursa inflammation, just because of the amount of transducer pressure that you need to optimally image structures in this region. Um, it can cause enough compression to uh, eliminate the blood flow that you would otherwise see. And so I'll also be going through the report kind of as we talk about each structure, um, just to get a sense of what we would typically write in um, our ultrasound report. So here, the ischial bursa appeared normal. There was no evidence of hyperemia on Doppler imaging. Then we typically move on to the evaluation of the hamstring tendons themselves, starting usually in short axis. And I just have a still image here. This is over the ischial tuberosity. Um, on more of the proximal region. And you see some cortical irregularities and the conjoint tendon sitting on top of it. I think we really get a better sense of what this tendon looks like on dynamic scanning. So the first video is going to be from starting at this hypo, hyperechoic triangle region and scanning proximally. And so you can see the conjoint tendon was right here. I'll play it one more time coming up. Semitendinosus muscle comes up pretty far proximally as well. So let's watch that one more time more slowly. So semimembranosus, sciatic nerve, conjoint tendon, and semitendinosus muscle, adductor magnus, biceps femoris. And so one more time, we keep our eyes on the conjoint tendon here, kind of following it up. It's getting thick. You still see some of the semimembranosus muscle, ex or sorry, semitendinosus muscle extending pretty far proximally here with the conjoint tendon in this region. And just be careful not to call this area of the semitendinosus muscle as pathologic tendon. Um, in this case, we do see that that tendon is hypoechoic. Um, there's some, it's thickened, there's some cortical irregularities there as well. And then this next video will be starting right up. Um, at the ischial tuberosity and scanning distally, just to get uh, another view of the image. So conjoint tendon, semitendinosus muscle, it's conjoint tendons coming down. And then we're going back up proximally again. And there's that semitendinosus you can see comes pretty far proximally. And then with all tendons, you want to look at them in both short and long axis. So here um, we have a long axis view with proximal on the right side of the image, ischial tuberosity, the conjoint tendon coming across the top. You can see it is a little bit hypoechoic. Um, there's some cortical irregularities on the ischial tuberosity here. And we did dynamic imaging with hamstring contraction. And you can see as this muscle contracts, kind of everything moves in continuity together, indicating that that tendon is intact, even with some of the hypoechoic regions that we see. 
And then again, we can put on the Doppler and we did not see, this is a short axis, or sorry, still long axis view, did not see any evidence of hyperemia in this region. And so the report that we would write just focused on the conjoint tendon was thickened, associated with cortical irregularity of the ischial tuberosity consistent with tendinosis, but the tendon was clearly attached to the ischial tuberosity and could be seen translating with hamstring activation. And there was no evidence of hyperemia associated with the conjoint tendon. So moving on to the semimembranosis, um, I think this is much easier to first find at that level of the hyperechoic triangle or the triangle of Cohen, just because on the ischial tuberosity, it sits fairly, um, it sits on the lateral side and you kind of need to angle in and it sometimes is difficult to separate that from the surrounding um, structures. And so starting down at the triangle of Cohen really can help you differentiate what is which is the semimembranosis tendon to start. And so here, just correlating again with our uh, pictograph, we have semimembranosis tendon here, the conduit tendon, um, sciatic nerve, and then the musculature surrounding it. And this will be a video, so we're starting slightly distal to where this picture is, and you really see how it's a little bit more hyperechoic tendon, like looking like normal tendon at this region. Um, and we'll scan from distal to proximal, and as we come proximally, that semimembranosis becomes very enlarged, very thick, very hypoechoic, and almost anechoic in this region. So of course, we'll take a look in long axis as well. We have proximal on the right again. Um, semitendinosis tendon is more superficial in this region. So we're kind of seeing this as the semimembranosis tendon is coming from the medial to the uh, more lateral orientation. And we start to see on the proximal side, much thicker hypoechogenetic, hypoechogenicity here. And then we slide slightly farther proximal to where we can see the ischial tuberosity. And um, there's this anechoic region uh, that measured 0.9 centimeters at this location. And the other thing that I, it's important to note when scanning the semimembranosis in this area, especially in long axis, you can get some anisotropy. And the best way to typically image it is if you have the transducer slightly farther lateral and you're really angling the beam of the ultrasound toward more medially towards the ischial tuberosity. So rather than being straight, like perpendicular to the ischial tuberosity, you kind of translate off to the lateral side and angle. Uh, the beam medially to get uh, this type of an image. Um, and then we have just a video kind of moving from lateral to medial to scan through this entire semimembranosis tendon here. So ischial tuberosity, um, semimembranosis tendon, semitendinosis is on top. And we move from medial to lateral and we still see this anechoic region seems to persist and it seems much larger as we come um, more to the lateral side of the tendon. And then looking at the same view, slightly more distal here now with contraction. So just to orient you, the ischial tuberosity would be up in this region. This here is the semi-tendinosis muscle, semi-membranosis tendon adductor magnus. And so as we play this video, I want you to watch how that semi-tendinosis contracts and differentially moves, but the semimembranosis does not seem to translate and it also becomes wavy, which uh, typically tells us that this is likely not attached at the ischial tuberosity and is not moving in conjunction with the semi-tendinosis and the adductor magnus. And then again, just looking at Doppler of that tendon, um, this is up in that hypoechoic region in short axis, and we did not see any evidence of Doppler flow. So going through the report here, um, there were a lot of findings. We typically write in more of a prose style and try to be as descriptive as possible about kind of our protocol of what we did as well as what we found. Um, so I'm gonna go through this, but it is a lot of text. So we started translating from distally to proximally in the transverse orientation over the semimembranosis tendon in a short axis view. And it was normal in appearance as it um, traversed from very medial to that more lateral location. Um, but as we translated further cranially from the uh, lateral position near the triangle of Cohen, 
It became significantly thickened and hypoechoic. And then upon continued cranial translation, there was some hyperechoic appearing tissue within the large anechoic area. Obvious tendon fibers could not be traced up to the ischial tuberosity um, with a similar appearance in long axis view. And then in long axis view, the patient performed knee flexion with hamstring activation, overlying muscle visualization translating, um, but the semimembranosus tendon was not translating. So given this lack of motion with hamstring activation, the lack of clear visualization of the tendon insertion, it's suspected that there is a complete tear of the semimembranosus tendon from its insertion on the ischial tuberosity with approximately 0.9 centimeters of retraction. And then there was no hyperemia in this area of presumed retraction. So moving on beyond the hamstring tendons to get this really comprehensive picture, there are several structures in close proximity that you can scan. Again, Dr. Borgstein covered some of these, but we'll review a few here. Um, and one of them is the sciatic nerve. And the, I have both of these images just showing that you can use both the curve linear or the linear transducer to see which gives you the most optimal view. Um, so in this image, again, lateral is on the left. We have the sciatic nerve sitting on top of the quadratus femoris. Um, the trochanter is over here with ischial tuberosity in that region. Um, same thing on this linear, uh, using the linear array transducer, the sciatic nerve is sitting on top of the quadratus femoris. And the sciatic nerve can be traced all the way from the sciatic foramen down to the triangle of Cohen. And when you're performing this scan, it kind of makes this, you know, shape down almost part of an H down one side and back up the other. And you have to kind of constantly account for the course of the sciatic nerve and the anisotropy when you're scanning. So I do have a video sciatic nerve here. This is starting at the sciatic foramen and coming down near the obturator internus. I can play that um, one more time. So we're starting up very close to the sciatic foramen and following it down over ischial spine to obturator internus. And then this next video is starting at the triangle of Cohen and going more proximally. So we'll keep our eyes on the sciatic nerve here as we come up proximally for it to sit on top of the quadratus femoris. And the sciatic nerve appeared normal, is what we'd say in our report. And then same thing, looking at the quadratus femoris, you can often image this in the same image as the sciatic nerve. Um, and then do dynamic testing where you're, you can flex the patient's knee and have them internally and externally rotate the hip to appreciate the space between the troch um, and the ischial tuberosity with the sciatic nerve sitting on top of the quadratus femoris here. And so for our report, we just say the quadratus femoris muscle is normal in appearance, no evidence of ischial femoral impingement with dynamic imaging. And you can also evaluate the posterior hip joint. We do have the x-rays in this patient that showed some moderate level of arthritis. And I think this evaluation is most useful in terms of finding like the sonopalpatory tenderness and convincing a patient that buttock pain could be due to their hip joint. Um, so here we'll use the curved linear transducer and we have the acetabulum as well as the femoral head. You can do a little bit of dynamic imaging where you just have them internally and externally rotate the hip. And you may be able to see some fluid, but mostly this is, we use it to convince them that their posterior buttock pain could be uh, related to their hip joint. In this patient, that was not the case. Um, and so we say the posterior hip joint was visualized and appeared normal. Looking at the obturator internus, so this is just proximal to the ischial tuberosity the obturator internus comes out of the lesser sciatic foramen and courses uh, across the top of the ischium here laterally to attach onto the um, greater trochanter. And you can evaluate this dynamically as well as you see with internal and external rotation, the muscle comes out of the pelvis. And in this case, um, again, the obturator internus was normal. And finally, you can get involvement very rarely of the sacrotuberous ligament in a patient with a hamstring injury. So you can take a look at that as well. This is the sacrotuberous ligament kind of coursing through here from the ischial tuberosity. It's coursing up towards the sacrum. Um, very hard to see uh, pathology of this ligament, but 
the sinopalpatory tenderness might be helpful. And adductor magnus muscle you see here um, off the medial side of the ischial tuberosity. And again, here, the sacrotuberous ligament was normal. So now moving on to our ultrasound report, like many of the uh, reports we've seen in the past, you kind of start with the typical things that we need, referring provider, where it was performed, what was the indication, um, the study type, the location that we were examining, the laterality, we compared it in this case to x-rays, um, and then our standard equipment and what transducers we were using and that we uploaded images. Then we move on to the findings and we typically use more of the pros uh, report, um, especially if there is significant pathology. And I'm not going to read this again since we went through it previously. And we conclude with the impression. So in this case, it was a complete tear of the semimembranosis tendon with 0.9 centimeters of retraction from the initial tuberosity and moderate tendinopathy of the conjoint tendon. And so that our impression is really what we want people to take away um, from the ultrasound. And um, if you are looking for kind of a complete review of proximal hamstring, um, tendon injuries and pathology. Here are two really good articles, especially this article by Bianchi that goes through a lot of different pathology in that region. So I'd encourage you to take a look at that if you're um, wanting more of this comprehensive overview of all the pathology. But otherwise I'll stop there and open it up for questions. Great job, Allison. That was, that was exactly what we want with these talks. And, you know, it's a very very complex area that I thought you you went through very nicely and um, and your images were were, were quite fantastic. Uh, I just have a couple points I'll make and then you know obviously if anybody has any questions either just unmute yourself or or throw them in the chat box. Um, you know for me when I'm doing post your hip scans, you know you, you did a nice job. I think one of your first two slides showing you know what you'll scan every single time and then the you know scan as indicated or as as needed. You know for me. I'll always include adductor magnus just because, you know, there's, there's often pathology that can be missed in that area. Um, I've, uh, have been bitten a couple times early on where, you know, we look at proximal hamstring tendons, excluding adductor and everything looked okay. And, you know, patient kind of failed treatment. Um, and then we came back, looked again and actually paid attention to the adductor and there was pathology there. So I'm maybe a bit scarred by that, but I tend to add that to to all of my proximal hamstring or posterior hip scans. And then the other point you made about um, image optimization with the semimembranosis tendon, you know, like you said, the the conjoint and the membranosis certainly don't sit in the same plane, and, and membranosis sits a bit deep and is a bit more oblique. Um, so you know, redirecting and reorienting your transducer to kind of angle the the, the transducer bit medial uh, can help to to optimize that tendon, otherwise you do get quite a bit of, um, of, of anisotropy. Um, let's see, anybody else have any comments or questions? Great job, Allison. I, just uh, to reiterate the point about using uh, a home base or landmarks, I think uh, anybody who's scanned somebody that's had a, a proximal hamstring tendon tear, especially a chronic one where you don't have hematoma to separate tissue planes can attest that it can, it can be difficult sometimes. And one thing that has been helpful for me, in addition just to using the um, issue of tuberosity is, you know, always just thinking about starting as distal as you need to until you find some normal pathology and then retracing the steps and really kind of defining what, okay, what do I have that's normal first? And then, you know, what's left. And another thing that I think on the other end of the spectrum, when you have more subtle pathology, I think that that's really difficult here, especially if you get folks that are, you know, have a higher BMI. Um, sometimes you just, it's, you just aren't going to be able to, to tell on things like tendinosis and, and partial tears. But, the, you know, as most of us see that the partial tears here tend to start on the deep side. And, you know, we often see them during interventions after the fact, but one thing I've found sometimes it can be helpful and especially a leaner patient is to use compression of the probe to try to sh see if you can shift the, at least the conjoint tendon. Um, uh, uh, so you can see where it's, it's might be peeled away from the ischial tuberosity and that's, that's uh, been helpful. 
All right, thanks, Jake. All right, well, <clears throat> if no other questions, again, Allison, that was that was really well done. So thanks, thanks for doing that. Um, we are off next week. We will be back with this case series on the 5th of March. Uh, Marianne Lutmer is gonna talk about uh, Alex Sultans. And again, that's on March 5th. Um, otherwise, again, great job, Allison, and everybody have a great Friday. Thank you so much.